This is a magical chimera of beige 90s weirdness. In this video, we'll take an in-depth look at this Macintosh Performa 630 DOS compatible inside and out and explore the strange realm of hybrid computers that was very much a thing back in the mid 90s. These were bleak times for Apple. Macintosh sales were plummeting while IBM PC compatibles were selling like hotcakes. Between 1994 and 1998, the PC market grew from 40 million units to 100 million units per year, while Mac sales dropped from 4.5 to 2.7 million during the same time. That huge and fast-growing PC market wasn't something to be ignored, and of course, Apple wanted in on the action too. So, in 1994, Apple introduced a DOS compatibility card, codenamed Houdini, that could be fitted in the Quadra 610 and the Sentry 610. That card, featuring a 25MHz 486SX, sold pretty well and was later superseded by Houdini 2, a new DOS card designed for the PowerMac 6100 in early 1995. The 630 came out a few months later and is a bit of an oddball. It doesn't use any kind of standard card, instead they just jammed a daughter board straight into the 68040 CPU socket. But more on that later. DOS cards for Macs wasn't something new. They had been around for a long time, but this was the first time Apple ventured into this area themselves. There's a great forum post in the 68K MLA forum detailing the history of these cards, and there's a link in the description if you want to learn more. I first learned about these things when I watched LGR's excellent video on the PowerMac 6100 DOS compatible a while back. Sometime later I came across this Performa 630 and I just couldn't resist picking it up. It was in a pretty dodgy condition when I got it, so the first order of business was to take it apart and clean it thoroughly. So let's begin by examining the innards of this bizarre machine. It's very easy to get access to the logic board on these machines. Simply unhook the plastic panel, undo a few screws and then pull the logic board straight out. Just give it a little wiggle if it seems stuck. Taking the rest of the machine apart is a little bit more complicated. First, the front panel needs to come off. Then there is a metal shield in front of the hard drive that has to be removed. Now the ID hard drive, the floppy drive and the optical drive can be pulled out. My optical drive didn't want to come loose though, so I saved it for later. The next step is to take off the top cover. First, some more plastic bezels in the back has to be taken off, and then the top cover can be slid off with a bit of force. This also releases the plastic side covers. Then there is the metal part of the top cover. Undo the screws at the back and then, much like the plastic cover, it slides off by pulling it forward. The floppy drive cable is attached to it with a clip, so it has to be carefully unclipped before the cover can be fully removed. At this point it was also easy to remove the CD-ROM drive. Then remove a single screw at the center of the case and take the drive bay assembly out. This assembly holds most of the cables in the case and is where the logic board connects to inside. All that remains of that is the power supply and the shelf that holds the fan. I removed these parts too so that I could clear out all the remaining dust and grime. Then it was just a matter of reversing the process and putting everything back together. This is definitely one of the stranger case designs I've come across. It just seems incredibly over-engineered and complicated to me. Sure, the slide-out logic board and drives is great, but surely they could have made that work with a simpler design. Well, anyway, let's move on to the logic board, which is really the star of the show here. And if the case seemed unnecessarily complicated, the logic board isn't much better. The DOS compatibility subsystem is made up of three separate boards. The main compatibility card, the game adapter card, and the sound expansion card. 
The main card plugs straight into the CPU socket on the logic board and holds a 33MHz 68LC040 CPU for the Mac side and a 66MHz Surix 486DX2 for the PC side. It also has a single memory slot and a expansion header which holds the second card, the Creative Vibra 16 sound card. This is essentially a regular ISA sound card making it great for DOS games. It even has a real OPL chip for those sweet FM MIDI tunes. The final card of the trio is the game adapter card that sits in the PDS slot on the logic board. According to Apple's developer notes, this card also holds the declaration ROM, which is essentially the firmware used by PDS and Nubus cards and is responsible for identifying the card and carrying out certain initialization routines. So essentially the game adapter card is responsible for registering the subsystem with the Mac OS, but once that's done, pretty much all of the communication is carried out over the CPU socket. Analog audio and video signals are carried over a 16-pin ribbon cable that connects to this special audio-video header on the main logic board. The benefit of this is that you don't need any awkward dongles and adapters on the back of the computer, everything just goes through the regular Mac display and audio ports. The downside is that you can't display the PC output on a separate monitor. According to the developer notes, the audio video header is unique for the 630 DOS compatible, meaning that it's not possible to upgrade a regular 630 with a DOS card. Data sharing is done over the CPU socket. This includes reading disks, sharing clipboard and passing messages between applications. All of this is handled by a custom ship called the Pretzel Logic IC, pun intended I assume. One of the functions of this ship is to translate between Big Endian and Little Endian, allowing the two different CPU architectures to interpret the data in the same way. I'm not sure why they needed this custom daughterboard solution for the 630, but I suspect it had something to do with the fact that it's based on the Houdini 2 design that Apple developed for the PowerMac 6100. But there was still high enough demand for 68K Macs in 1995 that they had to sort of backport the system to the 630 so that they could get a DOS compatible 68K Mac on the market. The logic board also has one of those weird Apple communication slots, and I happen to have a matching network adapter on hand, which I installed before putting the logic board back in the chassis. Finally, it's time to dive into the software side of things. And this is where this machine really shines. The integration of the DOS subsystem is carried out really well. Configuration is done through a simple application. From here you can configure disk drives, COM ports, file sharing and memory settings. The PC can also be turned on or off or restarted from here. Switching between the PC and the Mac is done by hitting Command Enter. If the PC wasn't already running, it'll start the first time you try to switch to it. As long as all the Apple drivers are installed on the PC side, everything pretty much just works. Copy something to the clipboard on the Mac and it will magically appear in the clipboard on the PC, and vice versa. This works not only with text, but also with graphics. The DOS subsystem uses a disk image as hard drive, much like emulators typically do. The image can be mounted on the Mac by double clicking it and it'll then show up on the desktop and you can drag and drop files just as with any other disk. The 
PC must be shut down if you need read-write access though, otherwise it'll just mount it as read-only. Another way to transfer files between the Mac and the PC is through something called MacShare. This is a driver that runs in the DOS environment and allows you to mount directories from the Mac file system as a drive letter on DOS. Floppy drive and CD drive is shared between macOS and DOS. With floppies, you have to insert them while being in the correct environment. So if you insert a floppy while the PC is active, it'll mount on the PC and macOS don't have access to it. Ejecting floppies on the PC is done with command E. CDs, on the other hand, work on both systems simultaneously. Ejecting CDs from DOS can be done with command Y. Performance seems to be comparable to a standalone PC of similar specs, although I don't have another 486 machine to compare against. Doom 2 runs okay, but I have to either run in low detail mode or reduce screen size a few steps to get a good frame rate. Some of the other older DOS games I've tried runs great. Another fun thing to do on this machine is to run DOS demos. I just love the juxtaposition of seeing second reality running on a Macintosh. So that's it, that's the Macintosh Performa 630 DOS compatible. It's a wonderfully over-engineered and odd piece of obsolete tech and I just love it. It's such a fun machine to play around with and it's been loads of fun to figure out how it works in the making of this video. Also I just want to thank everyone for subscribing and commenting and being all around awesome. I'm amazed at all the positive feedback and kind words I've been getting on the channel. I really didn't expect so many people to find and watch my videos so soon, so yeah. Don't know what to say really other than thanks. And thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this deep dive into the strange world of Mac PC hybrids, consider subscribing for more odd and obsolete shenanigans in the future. Take care and see you next time. <laughs>